talk today will comprise three main sections. Uh, I will begin by telling the story of Alexander the Macedonian and Haidafa, the queen of Maghrib, meaning uh, North Africa, as narrated in one of the most celebrated epics of pre-Islamic Iran, the Shahnama. This text was compiled at the beginning of the 11th century by the celebrated poet Firdausi. I will then show you some manuscript paintings produced in different cities that depict a key episode of the story, of a story, the story, which were executed in 15th and 16th centuries. Finally, I will introduce the Ottoman versions of the story, executed between 1570 and 1620, and address their distinctiveness in the Ottoman political cultural context. In other words, I will focus on Alexander's transformation at the hands of Ottoman painters. Firstly, let me tell you about the image of Alexander the Macedonian in the Islamic world. It is going to be really brief because this itself is a topic of another lecture. Alexander is known as Iskandar or Iskander in the Islamic tradition and often has been identified with a certain Zulkarnain or Zulkarnain in Turkish who is mentioned in Oran as a wealthy, wise and powerful sovereign with semi-prophetic qualities. The Quranic sage king Zulkarnain, literally the possessor of two horns, is said to have traveled to the far eastern and far western corners of the world and built an iron wall against <coughs> the people of Gog and Magog. Those deeds, among others, are traditionally attributed to Alexander in varying historical and literary texts. In other words, Alexander was adopted and Islamicized uh, through the identification with the Quranic Zulkarnay and was granted with the image of an ideal ruler for many leaders to be emulated was long to be known as Zulkarnain of the age by them. Now I will turn back to the paintings illustrating an episode from the encounter of Iskandar and Kaidafa. In Firdavsi's Shahname, the story of Iskandar and Kaidafa in its bare essentials is as follows. On his way back from the Kaaba, Iskandar sojourns in Egypt. During his stay, Kaidafa, the queen of Maldiv, sends a painter to Egypt to observe Iskandar and to, uh, and to have his portrait made. When the painter brings Iskandar's portrait, the queen examines his outer appearance reads his inner qualities and regretfully understands that no one could defeat him in a battle. Actually, Kaidafa has a commanding knowledge uh, in the science of physiognomy, which is the science, very old antique science, um, helps uh, people to read inner qualities, inner characteristics from looking, from looking uh, at the um, outer appearances 
uh, what he or she wears, what color of her eyes, etc. etc. Um, in turn, having heard of her and her treasure, of the riches of her empire, and of the invincibility of her armies, Iskandar addresses a letter to her, asking that her dominions be placed under his command as his tribute. Kadafe objects, writing that, due to the size of her army and the bravery of her fighters, her lands are exempt from conquest. At a later time, after several relevant events, including the enslavement of Kaidafe's son and the restoration of his freedom, Iskandar, disguised as his own ambassador, pays Kaidafe a visit at her palace to present, his, her, to present her his very own message. During the course of the splendid reception ceremony, Kaidafe, suspicious that he is the king himself, cannot take her eyes off the messenger because she knows the physiognomy, so she understands that this guy cannot be a, an ordinary envoy, but the king himself. She orders that Iskandar's portrait be brought to her, and matching the portrait and the envoy, um, she realizes that he is, in fact, Iskandar himself. After sending her people off, she proceeds to address the king by his real name. Iskandar first denies this, but when Kaidafe produces his likeness, he has no alternative but to admit the truth and to reveal his real identity. Over the course of the story, they eventually make peace, and Iskandar leaves Margaret. The story is based on the Greek Alexander romance, written and has been recounted with minor variations by Firdavsi and by subsequent generations of Muslim poets. The most prominent of these was uh, Nizami's Iskandar Name. Nizami was one of the greatest Persian uh, poets of the uh, 13th, 12th century. Actually, 14th and 15th century poets went on to reinterpret the story. The episode was depicted in numerous illustrated copies of Shahname and Hamse Iskandarname of Nizami. Actually, mostly depicted in Nizami's copies, the iconographic model of the subject matter was somehow set in the 15th century and repeated throughout the 16th century with slight differences. As you see, this is one of the most beautiful um, manuscript paintings depicting the famous scene. Here, Kaidafe sits on her throne, and you see here um, Iskandar disguised as his envoy, and Kaidafe told the servant to bring the portrait, and she is examining the portrait and most likely matching with the envoy to see that he is actually Iskandar himself. Um, I have several copies, uh, several versions uh, of the same scene. This is, um, this comes from um, Enizami's Iskandar Name, uh, made in Shiraz in 1470. Uh, six, and here you see Iskandar holding his portrait made on a silk cloth, um, as you can see, um, um, it's not a paper, uh, so he's, he's looking at his um, 
portrait made uh, depicting himself as a king with his crown and everything. So he he is actually he is in an awe and he's frightened because he's in the hands of uh, Kaidafes uh, without any military backup actually. Um, another picture of the same scene. Um, I think I don't need to um, uh, to give you many details. You can tell this is uh, Alexander Iskander, this is Kaidafe, and this is his portrait. Uh, so this is from the 16th century. Um, another one, again from Shiraz, an Akkoyunlu manuscript. Uh, here you see uh, Iskandar looking at his portrait. This time portrait is not as um, as colorful as the other ones. So this this is um, a different style which we call uh, kalemisiyahi or black pen painting. Um, just a style there. Okay. And another one uh, showing again a Safavid painting, showing again Iskandar and his portrait. And as you can see, um, um, the more uh, concerned the artists were about the overall aspects of the <coughs> painting or qualities of the manuscript, the more meticulous they became in approach, in their approach to the issue of the portrait likeness to the um, person who held it. Um, so you can tell that the um, the artists are concerned to have a photographic quality of the portrait. Um, and they, um, apparently they um, consciously uh, made a difference between the sitter and the person who holds it. Um, because here, the person is in a, from uh, take care. Yeah, in a different headgear, and he is the envoy, whereas uh, the picture, the portrait, depicts a king with the uh, crown. Uh, in all those portraits, Iskander is almost always portrayed, either sitting or standing, but always in full length. This posture is a cliché form of portrait depictions in Islamic book painting. In fact, these types of portraits were found in different literary texts depicting various protagonists such as Shirin, Koma, Iskander, or Mushteri, falling in love with the portraits of the beloved. Here, for instance, these two paintings from different copies of Nizami's Hosrev Shirin, the love story of Hosrev, the Sasanian uh, king Hosrev and uh, his Armenian lover uh, Shirin, um, shows Shirin, the Armenian princess, um, admiring the portrait of Hustrev. In fact, she falls in love with Hustrev's likeness and goes to Iran to find him. And then her traumatic love and hate relationship with Hustrev starts, which constitutes the main narrative of Nizami's poem. Um, so when, when she was having enjoying the uh, springtime, and she sees um, the portrait of Hüsrev hung uh, uh, on a tree, and then she sees it, and then she, she, she sort of intoxicated by the portrait's 
beautifulness and then she, she falls in love, etc. And, and the story goes on. Uh, another two paintings from the same story showing again, you see here, Hushrev is either sitting or standing, but he is always shown in full length. Uh, so this is really the, the cliché uh, for uh, the portrait of a portrait. Um, so it is a sort of stereotypical posture for the um, portrait making. Now let me turn to Ottoman interpretations of the scene. Several tra translations of Firdevsi's famous epic Shahnameh were made by Ottoman poets and some illustrated by Ottoman artists. Three copies of the Ottoman Shahnameh include a depiction of our topic, which is Kaidafe recognizes Iskander by his portrait. In these paintings, Iskander's portrait is depicted as clearly distinguishable from other examples produced in various centers of Islamic bookmaking in terms of both formal and contextual. The first painting under discussion is in a copy of Tarjumi Shahnami Firdesi, meaning translation of Firdesi's Shahnami. A verse translation of Shahname by Sherif, a poet from Amit, the Arbaker. Sherif translated Shahname into Turkish for the Mamluk Sultan Kansu al Ghori in the first decade of the 16th century. The Ottoman manuscript was copied from the sole extant manuscript of Sherif's original illustrated, original illustrated copy, sorry, that most likely found its way to the Topkapı among the war spoils of Selim the uh, first 1516-1517 campaign against Mamluks. So the, the original uh, Mamluk manuscript uh, includes a painting of Iskandar and Kaidafe which is not much different from the traditional interpretations of the scene. As you can see, again, the uh, portrait of Iskandar it shows him in a uh, cross-legged position, posture, uh, in full-length uh, composition. Uh, the Ottoman manuscript was the first illustrated Ottoman copy of the uh, Mamluk translation of Shahname, um, was copied in Istanbul in 1544 and illustrated at a later date. The stylistic features of the paintings make an attribution to Nakkash Osman and to 1570s uncontested. It's really, he, it's undeniably his own style. The painting follows the established iconography and shows Kaidafe sitting on his throne at the right hand side and um, showing the portrait to Iskander who is sitting to her left. Although Iskander's face uh, is heavily repainted, uh, it is nevertheless evident that prior to later interventions, uh, the portrait was a realistic likeness of the person who was depicted. The second representation of the episode comes from a copy of a prose translation of the Shahname made in for, uh, 1450-1451 under the patronage of Murad II, uh, father of Mehmed II. This manuscript, this specific manuscript, this copy, is dated to 1584 
and its paintings indicate that they were executed in the royal studio by an anonymous painter whose works survived in other royal manuscripts executed in 1580s. Here, seated next to Kaidafe, um, Iskander again looks at his own image held by a servant. The third painting dealing with the same theme is found in another copy of Shirif's translation, the first, like the, the first one we have seen, the Memluk one, the original, uh, translation of the Shahnameh, now in New York Public Library. Uh, this manuscript was copied in 1616, in, in between 1616, 1620, in Istanbul and refurbished later in 19th century. But this specific uh, painting um, is one of the pictures in the manuscript which is not touched actually. You don't see any refurbishment or anything, any intervention. And uh, the painter is one of the leading artists of the late 16th and early 17th centuries. The painting Though richer um, in the depiction of its setting uh, is nevertheless related to its predecessors. Here, the palace is depicted in a detailed and ornate way. On the left side, as usual, Gaidafe sits on her uh, throne with a small pool underneath. Um, with her entourage uh, behind her, while on the right, Iskander sits on a nicely done uh, chair or stool, um, and with his men standing behind him. You can even see the uh, a black eunuch uh, peeping from the uh, door. Um, a servant girl, as usual, shows him his portrait. Now, what we find, what we find in these three paintings are Ottoman interpretations of the subject. From the 1570s to the 1620, by three major artists of the time. The illustrations demonstrate the principles that form the style of 16th and 17th century Ottoman painting. In these examples, therefore, depictions of the setting and in particular the figures' outfits are different and as, as it to be expected, diverge from their Turkmen, Timurid and Safavid counterparts. But the most striking peculiarity in this iconography, which they share, and which distinguishes them from other Islamic interpretations, is the distinctive way in which they depict the portrait of Iskander. All these portraits are in bust form, framed, and rendered in three-quarter profile. The similarity of the sitter, and when you look at them, the sitter is impossible to overlook. They all depict the same person, actually. The person who is carefully depicted in these portraits has a short black beard and wears a rather bulbous turban wrapped around a lightly sloping cap. With his distinctive facial features, his headgear and his uh, outfit, this portrait is neither an imaginary nor a casual image of Iskander. What we have at hand is a real portrait 
of a real person, which bears certain characteristics that make him easily recognizable. This peculiar iconographic approach raised two questions. Firstly, what is the real identity of the person who is depicted as Alexander? And secondly, why is Alexander transformed and given this person's identity in the hands of Ottoman artists? Through such readily identifiable traits, these portraits all depict Mehmet II. An examination of Mehmet's extant portraits drawn by Italian and Ottoman painters during his lifetime show that his facial features and headgear are easily recognizable in the portraits of Iskander. These two images show his portrait medals by two Italian artists, Costanzo da Ferrara and Gentile Bellini, who were specifically invited to Istanbul by the Sultan to cast his medal in line with current fa fashion prevailing among European rulers. Um, his celebrated portrait by, made by Gentile Bellini in 1480 depicts Sultan Mehmet in three-quarter profile beneath a marble arch and um, behind a parapet uh, draped with a jewel uh, encrusted embroidered, embroidered textile. He wears a fur-lined Haftan, and the voluminous or bulbous turban, typical of scholars, ulema, which he is said to have frequently worn. As a later, circa 1510, most likely, copy suggests, Gentile and his followers continued producing replicas of the <coughs> portrait. Mehmet's portraits were also made by Ottoman artists during his lifetime. So these are two famous uh, portraits of Mehmet the Conqueror, Mehmet the Second, um, made by two famous Turkish um, artists which we call them, actually, we don't know their name, but with the help of some uh, historical documents, we call them Sinan Bey and his, his student, Shiblizade Ahmed. Um, as you can see, his image from the Ottoman painter's hands um, are almost, uh, they, they have the same facial features with the ones made by the Italian artists. Um, actually, his image in serial sultanic portraits uh, or in historical manuscripts recounting his reign executed at the end or the late 16th century imperial studio follows earlier models for his likeness. These are from um, late 70s, early 80s, actually. I am using the word following since those earlier images of Sultan Mehmet have been available to the painters working at the court studio in 1580s. It was important for Ottoman court painters to depict the Sultan through their individualized physiognomic traits. Thus, in uh, 1587, um, 1578, 
When the court historian Saint Lokman undertook the project of preparing illustrated histories of uh, the Ottoman house, he and his collaborator, painter Nakash Osman, apparently realized the problem they were confronted with. They needed authentic images of the earlier sultans, whom they had seen neither in person nor in pictures. They therefore approached the Grand Vizier Sokulu Mehmet Pasha and submitted a request to receive the missing portraits which they knew to be in the possession of Frankish masters in order to use them as models for their own works. That they only requested portraits of sultans earlier than Mehmet indicates that they have already using his extant images as models. In fact, Sokullu Mehmet sends a message to the Venetian Senate through the bylaw Nicola Barbarigo, asking a portrait series of the Ottoman sultans, starting from the founder of the dynasty. The state had most likely Veronese, or his atelier, to make the portraits and sent them to Istanbul. Apparently, there was an awareness for the accurateness of the Sultanate portrait, portraiture. The Ottoman artists had developed certain real or imaginary models for the portraits of their Sultans and, of course, for the portrait of Mehmet II. Now, let us turn back to Iskandar's portraits, which in fact depict Mehmet. You can, you can see. Don't they depict Mehmet? They do, actually. Yes, um, this displacement or replacement of Iskandar's likeness by Sultan Mehmet's open, Sultan Mehmet's, openly suggest an identification of the two. And this identification was still recognized a century after the Sultan's death. Sultan Mehmet's claim of being a world conqueror paved the way for this identification with Alexander of Macedon or Iskenderi Zulkarnay. His cultural policy reflects a universal claim that parallels his political and military ambitions. Accompanied by verses from the Quran, the title Sultan Mehmet has chosen to use on the inscription of the Imperial Gate, Babu Humayun of the New Palace, Topkapu Palace, he built on the remains of the Byzantine Acropolis dated November, December uh, 1478, uh, announced his claim as a world conqueror to friend and foe in Arabic, the common language of the Islamic world, saying, the Sultan of two continents and the sovereign of two seas the shadow of God in this world and the hereafter, his servant between the two horizons, meaning east and west, like Iskandar or Zulkarnay. Um, the earliest accounts of Sultan Mehmet's aspirations to be the new Alexander come from the literature of the fall of conquest of Constantinopolis written by the humanists who were in the city during the siege. These texts, consisting of mostly of letters written just after the capture of the city, emphasize how this was a self-identification on the Sultan's part. In fact, the inscription on Bellini's portrait which evidently was the product of Mehmet's artistic patronage, introduces him as Victor Orbis, meaning world conqueror. 
In his reports uh, upon his return to Venice, Nicola Sagundino, who visited Istanbul as a member of the Venetian ambassador's retinue, to attend peace negotiations in 1453, makes extensive mention of Sultan Mehmed's keen interest in history, of his familiarity with the accomplishments of the commanders and kings of antiquity, in particular Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great, and of his desire to have their histories translated into Turkish. Sagundino's report is only one of the several factors that perpetuate this conviction. Similar statements appear in various surviving works of Italian writers. Sultan Mehmed's interest in the biography and the accomplishment of Alexander the Macedonian is not merely a legend. A copy of Arian's biography of Alexander, which is Anabasis, dated to 1460s on the basis of watermarks, and prepared for Mehmed's private library in the palace scriptorium, still exists among the Sultan's book at the uh, Sultan's books at the Topkapı Palace. In fact. Lauro Fuirini maintains that his daily reading of the Anabasis is precisely what shaped his ideal to be the ruler of all lands. Lending further credence to this, the history of Alexander by Quintus Rufus is also preserved in his collection at the Tukapur Palace. Although not veri verifiably intended for Mehmed's own library, an illustrated copy of the Alexander Romance in Greek, possibly confiscated during the conquest of Trabzon, indicates that illustrated copies of the Alexander legends in their original language circulated and were read across the Ottoman world. Presumably copied for Alexius III Komnenos, who reigned in between 1349 and 1390 in Trabzon, the manuscript includes Ottoman Turkish annotations. There you can see. Some of them are in red, actually, more readable. Uh, identifying their subjects. The the, the subjects of the paintings. Um, actually, I, I have chosen specially this, this, this miniature uh, for this talk because, as you can see, this is the Greek Alexander Romances version of the story of Iskandar and Kaidafe. Here you see the, the painter Kaidafe sent to Egypt to make a portrait of Iskander, makes his, his portrait, Iskander's portrait, in secret. And then he brings the portrait to Kaidafe um, to, to be uh, inspected by him. So he ha she has, she has a, a small chest where he keeps where she keeps the, the portraits of the other also the other um, leaders or generals portraits because she she knows the the science of physiognomy so once in a while she has she has varying um, portraits in her treasury and whenever she needs to to investigate a, a commander's bravery, for instance, she she wants the chest to to take the portrait of the person and to to investigate, to examine the portrait, to understand if he is enough <coughs> brave or not. So, 
Um, anyway, uh, while there is no information available as to when, by whom, or for whom the notes were added, they nonetheless testify to the Ottoman identity of the work's owners. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, in these notes, um, the the person who 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 has written these notes, he directly used the Greek text. Um, for instance, um, the names of the personages in the story are. Ottomanized Greek versions, the Ottomanized Greek names. Uh, for instance, um, the 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 name of the uh, the name of uh, Alexander's father uh, in the Islamic texts in Persian, Arabic, or Turkish texts, he is called Feylekus, um, and his teacher. Um, Aristoteles called, is called Arastu, whereas here, in these notes, for instance, we see instead of Felicus, we see Philippus, which, which comes from Philippus. So it is a direct rendering from Greek rather than using the Islam Islamicized versions, actually. It is interesting. Um, it cannot be a coincidence that Ahmedi's Iskandername, the Turkish version of the Alexander legend, was produced in the same years during which the image of the Macedonian conqueror, Fatih, was brought to the fore and that two amply illustrated copies were <coughs> executed during the reign of oh, Sultan Mehmet. <clears throat> so these are two uh, paintings um, from um, a copy of um, Iskandar Nami written in Turkish by uh, Anatolian poet Ahmedi. Um, this one is um, unfortunately these two copies are not dated, uh, but the, the style of the paintings and the outline, the, uh, the outline of the manuscripts, um, the, the um, um, quality of the paper, everything uh, suggests that they, they are made uh, in between 1460, 14. 70, either in Istanbul or in Edirne, because we have other uh, dated uh, manuscripts uh, showing the same stylistic um, This is the Iskandar you studied in Venice. Yes, yes. This, this is uh, the Venice copy of Iskandar. Now. And it, this was my dissertation. This is your Iskandar. My Iskandar. And uh, these two are um, two different, um, two other uh, paintings from the same manuscript, which is now in Venice, Biblioteca Marciana. Um, it has 66 paintings. It's a, it's a very lavishly painted uh, uh, manuscript. Uh, these two are, uh, they, they, they belong to uh, another copy of Ahmedi's Iskandar Name, which is now in St. Petersburg. Um, apparently, uh, as I said, they don't have, neither of them have, have, have any um, attribution to any patron or anything about the date. But apparently, the, the stylistic uh, features and other uh, codicological um, clues show that uh, they were made, the first one, the Venice one, 
uh, most likely was made for Mehmed II and this one most likely was made for uh, Mahmud Pasha, the Grand Vizier uh, Mahmud Pasha. Um, uh, who was a close relative of the Greek humanist uh, George Amurutses of Trabzon, who was an influential member of Mehmet's retinue and a figure instrumental in perpetuating his Alexandrian image. Um, apart from these, uh, these manuscripts, lavishly illustrated and showing the scenes from the life of legendary Islamicized Alexander. Um, in the texts of Sultan Mehmed's historians, his identification with Alexander Iskanderi Zulkarnay is a recurrent theme. Christovulos of Imbros in the preface of his Greek Historia, which he dedicates to Mehmed, which tells the reign of Mehmed, actually, um, which is written in Greek, as you see the, the, the open page, exalts the Sultan and claims that his successes were by no means less than significant than those of Alexander the Great. So he compares Alexander and Iskander, and he he's actually, he says that um, Fatih Mehmed is uh, much more important than Alexander the Great. Um, whereas, or besides that, um, in Dursun Bey's Tarihi Ebu Feth, Ebu Feth, written in Turkish, um, which tells again the, the reign of uh, Mehmed II's reign, um, Sultan Mehmed is not compared directly to Alexander. He's not introduced as new Alexander, uh, but befitting an Islamic Ottoman sovereign, the text opens, as you can see here, um, with the with the 82nd verse from the Surah al kaf Kaf, sorry, um, saying, "They will ask you, they will ask thee of." Zulkarnay say, I shall recite unto you a remembrance of him. So this this famous verse starts um, the fa this this famous verse actually is in the beginning of the chapter, let's say, or paragraph where you can find information on Zulkarnay in the Quran. So it starts with that verse, um, and this reference introduces the Tarihi Abu Faith, Tarihi Sultan Mehmed, as the Tarihi Zulkarnayn, actually, and links Sultan Mehmed directly to Iskanderi Zulkarnayn. Well, this identification was so rooted that portraying Iskander after more than a century, an Ottoman painter replaces his bust with one of Mehmed II. And, th and other Ottoman artists, and other Ottoman artists, even 20 or 50 years later, replicated this image, either because they copied their master's work or because they themselves subscribed the same idea of identity. Thank you, Ed.